is trying to understand how can actually technology help. Clearly, trust is important, integrity is important, um, but how can technology help to strengthen that? So with that, I'm going to now hand over to Roy Sibard. Um, he's basically the CEO and co-founder of Gold Money, and with that, can you please share your thoughts? Thank you. Oh. So thanks again uh, to the LBMA and Tequila for having me at this uh, wonderful conference. It's my first time uh, speaking here. Um, I guess I, I don't have prepared remarks, so I'll give a bit of a story. Um, I used to run a, a long, short hedge fund uh, through the financial crisis. And uh, it was in 2008 and 2009 that I really decided that I wanted to focus on the precious metals industry uh, because I felt that um, it was a great opportunity for me to take some of the knowledge I had acquired um, and proselytize that knowledge to the average person, the average retail investor. And so I decided, along with my co-founder, Josh Crum, who was an economist at Goldman's, um, to reorient our lives towards one mission, which is to broaden access to physical precious metals. And we, um, w when we analyzed the market and we began to make some of our, some of our first physical gold trades, um, uh, to some of what Sakila mentioned, we, we were perplexed by how antiquated the system was. You know, the first time we ever uh, did a trade with one of the big banks, it was a T, T plus six settlement, and um, the back office was literally sending us spreadsheets. And so we decided to um, build a better settlement system. And we started with uh, a system that we designed called Aurum. Uh, we invested our own capital. And within two years, we had um, you know, the equivalent of, of, of what's being asked in the R RFP, which is uh, a private blockchain, uh, instantly settleable, um, physical vaulted solution, which we built only uh, as an initial axiom so that we could then build our front end platform, which was the, the direct consumer side. And we called it BitGold, uh, and we uh, went out and raised a Series A, and it became a, a very successful uh, concept and business. And today that, that whole group is called Gold Money, uh, and it oversees about $2 billion of, of precious metals and for 1.5 million clients. And we do things like allow you to transfer your gold and spend your gold on a MasterCard, uh, buy coins and redeem coins. But if we're talking about the topic of technology uh, and marrying technology with precious metals in order to uh, increase transparency, standards, integrity, the, the one industry that I'm even more passionate about that I discovered over the last two and a half years is the jewelry industry. And uh, if you study the flows of uh, gold production most of the mined physical metal is going directly into the jewelry industry, uh, not the investment industry. Um, and what, what the numbers are about $300 billion a year is the annual jewelry industry in terms of at the point of sale, the retail, in, the retail purchaser buying the jewelry at the point of sale. And it's, it's really a bifurcated market. Half of the market is in the east and half the market is in the west. And the uh, eastern market when you travel there, you see that these people aren't really buying jewelry, they're buying gold. Uh, it's generally 24 carat, sometimes 22 carat, and they're buying the jewelry by weight. And when you walk into some of these stores, there's just as many people selling the jewelry as buying the jewelry. It really is a store of enduring value. And in my own journey of inquiry, I've written a few papers about this, I was um, surprised to see that in the West, it used to be the same exact thing. Uh, you could go back 80 years, and Charles Tiffany, uh, the founder of Tiffany's, was advertising uh, jewelry in the New York Times by weight, by, by ounce weight. And so I think what's happened is in, in the West, um, maybe owing in part to some of the prosperity of the baby boomer generation, the Western jewelry brands have, to a certain extent, forgotten the, the, the sacred role of jewelry as a store of value, something that should maintain its original purchase price and perhaps even rise like stocks or property or art. And so the, the big idea I had uh, a few years ago was to take the ancient tradition that's still alive and well in the East and bring it to the West by building a direct-to-consumer um, luxury jewelry brand that would only sell 24 karat gold and platinum jewelry and then using technology, sell it by weight. 
so that the price is changing every single day. When gold goes up, the jewelry is more expensive. When gold goes down, the jewelry is less expensive. And uh, I'll take you through some slides, but, but one of the things I did want to mention is there were two slides that really resonated with me in Sakila's presentation. The, the first slide um, was, was how the LBMA sees itself as sort of a standard bearer of trust and integrity and transparency. And uh, while I think that the um, mission on the responsible sourcing side is uh, a really admirable one, I genuinely believe that there's a lot of work uh, that needs to be done on educating the consumer, the Western consumer, on, on how to buy jewelry. And if I can give you a few examples, uh, if you walk into one of the mainstream uh, jewelry brands today, uh, and you ask them what the weight of a piece of jewelry is, a piece of jewelry which is just homogenous metal, say like a Cartier love bracelet without diamonds, they won't tell you what the weight is. Um, and, and if you buy a diamond, they're pricing it by carat weight. So these are things that would, you know, under any circumstance be viewed as FTC consumer violations. Uh, the information about the weight isn't disclosed because they don't even want consumers to consider that jewelry should be priced by weight but the, 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 jewel, the, the gold has a cost in weight in terms of the energy that goes in to extract it. The gold is priced by weight on the futures exchanges. Nobody is buying gold in any other metric other than weight. So why is it that at the, at the level of the jewelry, uh, consumers have no clue about this? And um, the other thing, the other slide that I found very interesting was the slide about fraud, where you used a few examples where uh, an old lady was defrauded for $12,000 with a, a tin bar, or there were some other examples. I would argue that the amount of fraud that's taking place in the jewelry industry uh, is orders of magnitude that. It's, it's through deception, through the idea that you're buying something at the store that will retain its value, and then you walk out and you find out six months later, or five years later when you go to the pawn shop, that it only had about 10% of its original purchase price in weighted value of metal. So what we've been doing is um, really two things. Uh, we, we marry technology in order to educate the consumer, but also to build these business models uh, without brick and mortar uh, uh, presence, uh, so direct consumer. And I'll just show you one slide. It's a very long, long presentation which you can find online. Um, but you know, this is a bracelet that I'm wearing here. And this bracelet outperformed the S&P 500 over the last 30 years. So, so there is a market even in the West to buy 24 karat jewelry. And if you can do that as an industry, you can change the paradigm and the psychology behind how Western consumers purchase jewelry. Today they're buying it as a discretionary item. So they're using discretionary dollars. But if you can change that paradigm, then you can tap into the wealth stock. If people can consider that when they buy jewelry they're making an investment rather than parting with the majority of the purchase price, I think the opportunity is immense. Um, I just want to show you uh, one really cool thing, a few cool things we do with technology. Uh, so we designed uh, an algorithm which every piece of jewelry that we manufacture, and we manufacture everything in the US, uh, we have our own factory that we've built, we have specific weights for each SKU. And then once the jewelry uh, is onloaded into our inventory, which is in a vault, the value of the jewelry is displayed as you're looking at it. Uh, and, and then we show you our fee. So we disclose to you how much we earn, and we disclose to you how much in gold or platinum values in each, each piece of jewelry. And then once you buy the jewelry, this is also really cool, it's just like an investment portfolio. You can track the value of your jewelry with the average price paid, and you can see your performance in 100 different currencies. And you can also sell the jewelry back to us. We send you an envelope uh, like the old way Netflix used to do, or you can exchange it. So these are really cool ways to use technology, in my view, to educate the consumer with good information. And, and what I've seen over the last decade, especially with, with my generation, dare I call myself a millennial, uh, is the, th the, the thing that really resonates with millennials is good information. Good information makes millennials feel very empowered. And when they discover something that you know, was, was perceived initially as conventional wisdom uh, through the time they were young, then, then they really uh, like to pounce. 
And so, yeah, these are some of the great things that we're doing. It's, it's called Manet. Um, we have a booth here. If you'd like to come by, we're actually giving away uh, some free jewelry. So you can come by and check it out. Um, but that's really how uh, I've taken the approach to marry technology uh, with precious metals and with a, with a great emphasis on the jewelry side. I really believe that the LBMA and the industry should focus on educating. So I, I don't think gold will ever lose its appeal. It, it, has, to, it has nothing to do with uh, consumer demands or economics or anything that has to do with physics. It has to do with the element. As, as uh, the, the speaker recently said, it, it's so difficult to, um, it's almost like a Sisyphean task to control the supply chain of gold because it's an element, right? It's, it's, it's a, atomic element that, you know, you could, it's impossible to, to, to get down and, and, and define it. But that's the same reason why people will always buy gold. But what, what I think the industry can do is improve the transparency uh, for how the consumer engages in jewelry. When they're buying jewelry, they should really know. And it, and it goes all the way to the point of sale as well. I think there can be some, some great standards implemented at the point of sale. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much for that, Roy, and actually your perspective on how technology can actually provide us with opportunities. And actually, the focus there being education and how technology can help us get to the end consumer in helping to understand and educate.